All right, so Matthew chapter 10. What has been happening is Jesus has been discipling um, a fairly large group of people. And um, what he did, and we've seen in the last few installments in Matthew, we saw that he actually started to concentrate on a few uh, men within the larger group. So at times he had thousands surrounding him, and they were looking for healings and uh, various different things. And then we see, we see that he has hundreds and, and even 70 that are more dedicated and kind of the support crew for the, for the group. And then we saw that he had chosen 12 to minister specifically. And, and when he calls them disciples, what he's doing is, is he's calling them to go to school with him. They're saying, he's saying, go to college with me. Because in those days, when you went to a university, you didn't really go to a university. What you found was a sage or a wise man or someone you wanted to learn from and be like. And then not only would you go to class with them, but you would also live with them. And so sometimes we think of discipleship, oh, once a week I get together with somebody. But the more you can be with people and see how they live and how they respond in certain situations and see how the teachings match up with reality, the more you're going to be able to learn. And so these men have been with Jesus. He calls them out specifically, and they've been seeing him heal people. They were just with him when he raised the uh, man that worked in the synagogue, his, his daughter, and they saw him as he healed the, the man that could no longer speak and the blind men. And, and so they were watching all of this. And then he tells them, I want you guys to go out and do the same thing that I've been modeling for you. I'm going to give you that same power. And he sends them out on a training mission. And we've been looking at that the, the last few times that we've been in this particular passage. But I do want you guys to know that, it's, that it is very important for you to relate to one another. Um, a lot of people thought, oh, it's the death of the church when COVID happened and everybody started watching online. I would say it was definitely a stalling of the church, even though you may have gotten more people to watch. Because true discipleship doesn't happen over a screen, because all you see on the screen are the words. You don't see the life behind it. And we have this, this modern phenomenon, really, in the last few decades of, of the mega church, where you might go to a church for 20 years and you never get to know the pastor, never talk to him, never, never see him in the store. But, but that's not ultimately true discipleship. True discipleship is us getting together and learning from one another in real everyday situations. And even our church, it's very hard for that to happen, but we do small groups. We do uh, home groups, koinonia groups. We do men's and women's groups, and we do discipleship groups, and we do uh, family um, ministry groups and young adult groups. And it's not just to divide up the church. Some people are like, oh, you're dividing up the church. No, we're trying to get the church into fall, smaller family units so that we can live life together, applying the principles of God together so we can really grow and challenge each other to grow instead of just hiding out in our houses. I often tell people, it's like, you know, some of the destruction of the modern church could be, you know, given to, um, in America, given to the, the invention of air conditioning. Because how many of us really know our neighbors? Now, don't get me wrong. I live in South Texas with you guys. I love my air conditioning. But without air conditioning, what would you do? You'd actually take walks. You'd be out on your porch. You'd get to know other people in your neighborhood. You'd be, you'd be gathered in places with other people, right? And so we, we hide away. But Jesus wants us to relate to people and understand this. The goal of the church is not to be big, is not to be famous. The goal of the church is to be effective. And that effectiveness comes through relationship. Why? Because of the whole of the law is summed up in love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is just like it. If you're going to love God, you also got to love people or at least try, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. And so it's relational. It's not just observational. You don't come as a consumer. You come as a player to play in the game, right? And that's why we're here, and that's why we always encourage people, go to a church work day. Go to a koinonia group. Go to prayer with Pastor Rod on Tuesday morning and Tuesday night, right? It's sweet, wonderful, deep, rich time as, as God calls us together. So he called these men out, and he says, now you're walking with me. You've learned. You've seen how I've done things. You've watched me call upon the power of the Holy Spirit and see people healed. Now I'm sending you out. And so we're looking at how he sends them out. 
And first of all, a warning here in verse 16. He says, behold, Matthew 10, 16, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about what you should speak, for it shall be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. So we looked at this a little bit last time we were together, but he says, be wise and harmless at the same time. You're sheep among wolves, but you've got a big shepherd behind you. And that's what keeps sheep safe. Don't stray far from the shepherd either. Hold on to him and hold on to his ways. Keep your eye on your shepherd. But he says, be wise and harmless. How in the world do you do that? Well, there's many ways to seek to be wise and harmless at the same time. And you need to understand, sometimes when someone comes up against you, they're breaking every rule in the book. And the problem is, as a Christian, you're not allowed to if you want to keep God on your side. Now, you can go out and do it your own way and not keep God on your side, or you can do it his way and allow him to defend you. But sometimes we just do stupid things as Christians. Would you all agree? Do I hear an amen? <laughs> Maybe not you, me, okay? It's, it's, it's all me, but sometimes we do dumb things. Spurgeon says of this, this verse about being wise and harmless. Now, understand, Spurgeon was a guy that spoke to 5,000 people every Sunday without a microphone. He was pretty stinking bold, and he had a lot of enemies, and he had a lot of, he was this bold guy, right? Leader. Very attacked in different areas. But he's going, I'm not just going out there and being stupid and picking fights where I shouldn't and wasting my time. So this is what he's saying about this passage. He says, do not cast pearls before swine, and do not introduce religion at unseasonable times. Hold your principles very firmly. But when you know a man will only blaspheme if he hears you name the name of Jesus, do not give him the occasion. So he's saying, in, in, in the most obnoxious situation, don't just go, hey, I just wanted to preach in the middle of, you know, the board meeting here, you know. <laughs> and it's like, no, don't, don't be foolish like that, right? He says, stand up for Jesus when time is fit, but do not exercise zeal without knowledge. When a man is half drunk or in a passion, leave him to himself and thus escape many of a, a brawl. Now, now, how many, like really successful, how much really successful ministry takes place at about 12 o'clock at a bar? Now, you might have the story, okay, that's fine. It happens, God can make a donkey talk, <laughs> right? He can save a drunk person. But it's not that productive. So if you spend all your time focusing and all your money focusing on ministering in bars at 12 o'clock at night, it's probably not prob the, the wisest thing to do, right? And that's what he's saying. He's not saying don't do it, but he's just saying be wise about it. So when a man is half drunk or in a passion, leave him to himself and thus escape many a brawl. At another opportunity, when the occasion is more favorable, then endeavor to instruct and persuade but not when failure is certain. Be prudent, and then hold peace when silence is better than speech. You know, and, and, and for example, today, you know, we, we have a large group that is, is promoting certain sexual things. And guys, you know, I, I share with you all the time, I have a heart for those that struggle with their, their sexual identity and, and their sexual desires, right? And I've counseled this for decades now. I care about these people, but I know if I show up at some parade somewhere with you know, some sign and I start yelling at people, it is not being productive. All it's doing is drawing attention to myself and causing angst amongst the people, right? But if I get that person one-on-one, -on -one, I can have a really, really good conversation with them. And that's just being wiser. You see how that works. There's so many people out there that need the gospel, and sometimes we just spin our wheels in places that just aren't effective. And that's what Spurgeon would say. And so, wise, but also following the rules of the Lord. And we have a, uh, an axiom or a truth here in this church. It's like, let's just make sure to keep Jesus on our side. Which means we better remain humble. Why? Because God opposes the proud and gives grace to who? The humble. Right? These, these various things. Just, I want to keep that, that shepherd right by me and on my side. And so be wise and also innocent. 
Now, again, verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Verse 17, But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you or whip you in their synagogues. We will, if you live a godly life, you're going you're gonna to get attacked, right? Certain resistance, it will come for sure. And you need to know where it's going to come from. First of all, those people you're trying to reach will resist you. Beware of men. Who are they trying to reach? Men. Don't be discouraged. Because some will respond, but expect it. And they will attack you. You know, serving God isn't about seeking the easy life, staying in fancy hotels and having people pat you on the back. Now, that's really nice when it happens. But you guys know we just got back from Brazil. And so we show up, and, and we're so excited to minister to the, these, these uh, Brazilian uh, pastors and their wives and everything. And, and we're in the middle of summertime here in Corpus, right? And, and it's hot, and we, we head down to the southern hemisphere where it's wintertime. But it's Brazil, you know? It's jungle, it's warm, monkeys and stuff like that. Yeah, it's true. But when you're, when you're near Sao Paulo and up in the hills around Sao Paulo, it can get really cold at night. My wife and I just about froze when we stayed up at that camp. <laughs> it got to be 40 degrees every night. And then we go in the shower. Okay, got to warm up in the shower. But if you turn the shower on full, it has this little electronic heater around the, around the shower head. Electronic heater and water. It's weird. But it goes right through the thing. And, and, and here's the thing. If you have it on full, you're freezing. It, and if you let it trickle out, it actually gets warm. So you're like... <laughs> you know, trying to get warm. Sorry for that word picture, but anyways. <laughs> but, but I tell you what, man, my wife and I did not complain. We are so blessed. Such a blessing. You know, and sometimes we'll stay in a hotel that has, you know, uh, as we're going out and ministering, we'll stay in a place that has um, um, mold. You know, the other day I was going to speak, and I woke up, and I couldn't even hardly breathe. Oh, now go speak for four sessions, right? And so, you know, things, things, it, but it's not about that. Serving God might actually take some sacrifice. Is he worth it? He is. And it may require that you may offend a few people. So Christianity is not about having all your needs met. It's about growing up also. My need was met. My sins were forgiven. My eternal address was changed from 666 Hell Lane to 777 Heaven Avenue. It's my address. What a blessing. But this side of heaven, now I get to serve the Lord. And if I'm going to serve the Lord with his spirit and his attitude, I'm going to, I'm going to see opposition. And what a blessing it is to be able to serve the Lord and to be used by Him. He came to save us and to give us a future and a hope. But signing up for Him is signing up for the military. And the war's been going on for a few thousand years. And the war is for eternal men's souls. The Lord loves human beings and wants every single one of them to be in heaven with Him. Satan wants to hurt the Lord. He could care less about you. You're just a pawn in the game. But if he can keep you from heaven, he's hurt the Lord. That's his goal. He just wants to hurt God. God loves you. If he can destroy you or keep you from him, he hurts the Lord. And this is the battle. It is war. You know, how many of you, if, if you signed up for military service, you know, thought that, you know what? I'm joining the Marines. I'm going to do, I'm going to do boot camp at Camp Pendleton sunny Southern California, Adirondack chairs, lemonade, umbrellas. Yes, that's what it's going to be about. That's not what you're expecting. With the Lord, it's, it's more of a serious battle than even communism. It's eternal. And uh, the, the, the funny thing is, you know, you, you might think boot camp is great, but then all of a sudden they hand you a gun and put you on the battlefield. What? You didn't set me up for this. You didn't train me for this. So the thing is, while you're still here on this earth, the Lord so desires to use you. And sometimes things will happen in your life that prepare you for more ministry in front of you. It prepares you for battle. And, and, and sometimes it is a struggle. And it's okay because the Lord builds you up in it. It's not always what you expect. 
Story of a lonely frog. Now, it's just a made-up story, in case you get... I'm not trying to say this is real, so don't argue with me later. Lonely frog calls up the psychic hotline. He asks the advisor on the other end, what, is, what does my future hold? And she says, you're going to meet a beautiful young girl, and she's going to want to know everything about you. And he gets so excited. He says, this is great. Will I meet her at a party? The psychic reader says this, no, you'll meet her in biology class. <laughs> it's not always what it seems to be. So your faith is the most valuable thing in the universe. Expect a war over it. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And, and it's so simple when you, when you get the idea of repent. We always think, repent, repent. You know, that's like with the guy in the suit and tie, black tie, all song, repent, and starts yelling at people. But repentance is pretty simple, and the illustration should show you how our life will be difficult and we will suffer in this life as we repent. Everybody who doesn't know the Lord is walking away from the Lord. And it might be in good ways, like I'm, I'm seeking education, but that education won't save you. Or giving away of their money, philanthropy, or whatever it might be. There might be good things, often they're mixed with very bad things as well, but the Lord isn't who they're seeking. They're seeking something else and they're never getting there. But repentance is walking away from God at first and then you turn around and now you're walking towards God. You ever walk down a crowded hallway where everybody's going the opposite direction? A lot of conflict, right? And that's what you do as a Christian. A lot of bumping going on along the way. Now, this is specifically given to these 12 men as they go out on this trip, this short trip, this mission trip. And so it absolutely was fulfilled by them. Okay, these things happened to them. But by way of application and historical facts. This has been true throughout all of history. It's still true today. It applies to us. We will face persecution. People that we're ministering to are going to attack us back. So they're going to be attacked by those who they're trying to breach. Now, it also says they'll flog you in the synagogues. What is a synagogue? It's like a Jewish church. It's a, it's a Jewish outpost where if they couldn't get to the temple, they had the synagogue. If there's 10 males in a community, they built a synagogue. And so there are little churches everywhere. And they're going to flog you. If you're truly walking with the Lord, you're going to be around religious people that will attack you because they have a false faith and lies, and they're going to oppose the truth of God in you. Expect persecution from the religious community. Some wolves are very religious, and they play unfair, and they seek to devour your faith. But again, you're not allowed in the rules of engagement to respond like a wolf, but you've got to be a wise sheep. And some of the greatest persecution to true faith comes from those claiming to have true faith. And that's happened throughout all of history. If you study history, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, have been put to death in the name of their God. And I would say, personally, in my life, some of the greatest hurt and opposition and disappointment has come from those that even claim to be Christians themselves. And the thing is, I was warned. You know, someone planting a church, and you come out here, and things are happening, it's like, you know, I'm doing such a good job, that's not going to happen to me. And then it does. Well, is it my fault? Well, the Lord warned me, didn't he? Sometimes I guess it could be my fault, but <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be my fault. Because Paul loved the city of Ephesus. I don't know if you guys realize this, but he sent Timothy to Ephesus. And so the two letters that he wrote to Timothy, he was actually writing to Timothy in Ephesus. He had sent Apollos there, Aquila, Priscilla, and then later on in his life, John lived in Ephesus. And Paul really saw this large, beautiful city as, an, as a, a, a stronghold for the church. And so he ministered a lot to it. And his last contact with the elders there are found in Acts chapter 20. And he's talking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And he says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and tell all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers 
to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. And so here's the thing. Don't be shocked. Don't be surprised if someone says, oh, but I'm smarter than you. I have more degrees than you. I have more wisdom. I've read this book. Do you ever listen to this guy? I don't know. If he's solid, I'll listen to him. But if he's not, I ain't listening to him. Because this warning is there. It will happen. Some people say, well, why is there conflict in the church? Because the Lord prophesied that there would be. Because there's a spiritual battle going on. The spiritual battle of all eternity is going on. That's why. Of course. And it's so funny. It's a, it, you know, and, and we can have just the weirdest tussles. We used to rent the Baptist Learning Center, and now it's called Stark College, I think. But we used to rent that for about two years as we were building this building. And I was really good friends with the pastor that was running the university at that time. And uh, so he and I had great fellowship. I was a pretty young man at that time, and he was a much older man. And we'd get together. He was Baptist. I was Calvary Chapel. And we just had a great time. We had the same heart, the same spirit that lived within us. But it wasn't true of everybody that worked there. One day a man was preparing for the next day, a professor. He was also a pastor here in town. And uh, there was a man who had left his church over certain specific reasons and started attending here. And this guy had written him like three letters, just absolutely attacking me, all my doctrine and everything about me. He had never met me. So I ran into him on a Sunday afternoon and he starts complaining about me to me because he didn't know who I was. (laughs) I just thought it was hilarious because I watched his face when he realized who I was. And he felt shame, and he should have. I hope, I hope he learned his lesson. I don't think it was just absolute evil. But selfishness had, had arisen, which caused him to put other, down other fellow workers in the body. And we shouldn't do that. Don't be surprised. It can grieve you, but be warned, it will happen. You know, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts lately about how, how churches have grown super fast, and then they've, they've fallen apart very fast. One of the most profound things that the people said uh, that that were doing these investigations was their charisma outpaced their character or their success outpaced their character. And then I started looking back on the history of our church. Guys, I worked three jobs for five and a half years as we were planning this church. And I always tell people, God was making it so I could be a, a better pastor. And I'm so thankful for that time. And even more so when I hear stuff like that. God wanted me to know that it's him and not me. And he wanted to, in a sense, put me in my place. And, and I'm glad that he did that. I still got to watch myself, right? Because pride can always puff up. But, you know, it, it happens. And the church can be a scary place. And, and I tell you what, I, I've been hurt by people uh, within the body, you know. I'm not surprised the Lord said it would happen. But do what? Be a sheep. Do things right regardless of how they're doing things. You don't fight evil with evil. You, you, you say, God, I got a problem here. And he takes care of it for you. Then in verse 18, it goes on, you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So now you got the people you're trying to minister to. You got the church. And now you even got the government against you. Now listen, historically, the government has claimed an inside tract with the gods of the culture in order to keep a grip on the populace's loyalty towards them. When a belief or religious system would oppose the government, inevitably conflict arose over the loyalty of the people. And so, who provides social welfare? The government? Or the church. Now the government only has right to rule because the Lord's given it right to rule. But it always grows bigger than that. And it tends to grow and grow and want more and more power and authority in people's lives. So understand this. Who, who does a better job at keeping 
someone in the family that's gone off the rails, let's just say sober? The family? Or the federal government in Washington, D.C.? It's the family, right? Start with the family. That's God's initial unit. Who's better at keeping someone, let's just say, with alcoholism on the straight and narrow so they can heal their life? The community and community groups like churches or the federal government in Washington, D.C.? The community, right? And we see where the money goes and everything else, right? So that, that's this argument between federalism you know, and, and um, centralized government. But centralized government can get so big and it doesn't really care and it doesn't know you. And this is the battle. But I want you to know, the government wants your loyalty. The government absolutely wants your loyalty. But in America, we have still have a lot of Christians. So what has this culture been espousing about Christians lately? Oh, you love babies? You're doing harm to the planet. You don't think abortion should be legal? You hate women. What? It's crazy, isn't it? You actually believe that a biological man is male and a biological female is female? You, you actually think that, that, that a man who has 50% more muscle mass than a female and is larger in every other aspect, including bone density, to compete against a female? And, 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 and you don't think it's fair, Christian? No? Oh, you're evil? Whenever all the science and all of history is, is on, you actually believe that a man and woman coming together in a committed marriage relationship, having children, you actually believe that's healthy? It's been healthy for thousands of years in every culture all over the earth. And I still believe that it is the healthiest way for children to be raised. And I'm evil for it. Think about that. So there is now, the, the, our, our government's getting larger and larger and it wants your allegiance and it's becoming more and more secular. And so it, there's, there's this oppos opposition. Listen, Christianity was born in the Roman times when emperor worship was starting to become the main denomination of the government. And so certainly they understood this and they were going to have opposition. But the thing about this, guys, it's not just a doggy downer time. He says, if you're persecuted for my sake, not for stupidity's sake, but for my sake, you're a testimony to me. And that's the thing. We are a testimony. We are going to be a testimony. And we should just stand straight because the government cannot promise you eternal life. But the Lord does. He is the one you should invest in. Listen, you need to be a faithful citizen. You, you, you need to vote, pay your taxes, all that stuff. And that's great. But your citizenship in heaven needs to trump your citizenship on earth, period. That being said, you as a Christian should be the best American citizen as long as you can still possibly do it. Because there's going to be times when it's just absolutely evil and we can't do it anymore. Right? But you will be opposed and it's natural for it to take place. And understand this, you're a testimony. And governments will oppose you. But here's the thing, who makes up a government? Humans do, right? So within that government, your heart is to see the people that you're talking to saved. And remember, Paul was brought up before the Romans, and he said to a Roman governor, he said, I wish that you could be like me, but without the chains. That was his desire for this man that was persecuting him. And so for us, our desire is for the person to be saved. And it's really hard to hate the policy and still care about and pray for the person. But that's what God would call us to do as sheep. Isn't that a hard thing to do? But we need to be different because everybody else hates the person and the policy that they stand for. But God tells us to love him and love others. And his desire is that none should perish and all should come to salvation. I have a pastor's group. There's 12 of us and eight of us are pretty active. 
And we write letters to politicians to tell them what God thinks of what they're doing. And then we invite them to meet with us. And the funny thing is they will meet with us because they're afraid of us. Because we could make a few phone calls and make them lose the next election for sure. We never threaten them with that or anything else. They're always afraid, right? It's a popularity contest. And so they want, they, they want us to like them, and so they'll meet with us. But when we meet with them, we don't talk about the policy. We talk about their soul. Because the policy is temporary, their soul is eternal. Right? And, and we, 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 I scream at the TV like you scream at the TV. When you watch the news, right? It's like, Rah! But God pulls me back, sheep, sheep, not a wolf. You're a sheep. Do things my way. Hate the policy, pray for the person, right? Even in the midst of attack. And you will be a testimony to God. Eventually, political Babylon that will rule the whole world someday will fall. But until then, every political system that opposes the Lord's plan and God's people will also fail. And it has throughout all of history. Egypt, what happened to their army in one fell swoop? They lost their whole army. Assyria, anybody been to Assyria lately? Vacation to there? Know any Assyrians? But they oppose God's people. They seem pretty, pretty fierce. And they're not around anymore. Babylon? It's ruins. We, we, we think we know where it is. But that kingdom fell. The Medo-Persian Empire. Nope. Greek? Nope. Greek is basically a, a... Sorry if you're Greek in here, but I've been there. And it's falling apart. Because they're not running it with strength, vigor, and biblical principles. It, it's becoming a third world country, and it doesn't have a whole lot of power in the world today. But they ran the world, didn't they? But they opposed Christianity, and they fell. Romans? They fell. It broke apart. The Nazis, they didn't outlast the Christians. Killed a lot of them, they didn't outlast them. The communists will also go the same way. America will go the same way. And God's government will stand. Psalm 2-1, I love this psalm. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a, vong, a, a vain thing, an empty thing, a foolish thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. We don't want Christians in any place of authority. We don't want God to have anything to do with what we're doing. And this is their plan, Right? And I love the Lord's response to these little peons living on this little piece of dirt on the edge of the universe, you know, surrounded by this medium-sized star amongst billions and billions and billions of galaxies with billions and billions and billions of stars, and we're just one of seven billion people on this thing, and we're going, God! He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. You know, it's like a toddler, you know, taking on a professional boxer. You know, like... It ain't, it ain't happening. The Lord shall hold them in derision. In disrespect is what it says. I, I don't respect that. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill Zion. And what this is, this is a prophetic passage. And it's speaking of Jesus. Jesus eventually will establish for a thousand years a rule and reign on the earth out of Jerusalem sitting on the throne of David. Verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. And you shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall dash them to piece, pieces like a potter's vessel. If you're an unbeliever, you better believe this. You, you, you better hope that this is just prophecy. Or, uh, excuse me, poetry. But it's prophecy. Now, therefore, be wise, O king. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. You guys that have authority, and the only reason you can have it is because I gave it to you. Be wise. Be instructed. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. When I meet with judges, when I meet with lawmakers, when I meet with people with seeming authority, I let them know, you know what? You're, you, if you're a lawmaker, who's the ultimate lawmaker? God, right? 
and you're representing God, you better do a good job. Or a judge, who's the ultimate judge? Right? It's the Lord. You represent the Lord. You better be a good and fair judge. Therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Whatever persecution you're facing, remember that. Blessed are you when you have your trust in him. When seeming weakness stands against seeming strength and speaks undeniable wisdom, regardless of the earthly outcome, God gets the glory. And it says this in verse 19 in Matthew chapter 10, but when they deliver you up in front of these authorities, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, over the years, I've heard certain Bible teachers or pastors say, I don't prepare my Bible messages. The Lord just shows up and speaks through me. You know what? Sometimes if I'm super busy and I, you know, I'll, I'll go, God, you've got to provide, <laughs> you know? But what happens if I do that every week? Because the Bible tells us, study to show yourselves approved, a workman who's worthy of his wages, right? And so we're to prepare. And always be willing for the Lord to step in and take over. But prepare. I'm not going to be presumptuous on God. I know sometimes he has to show up. Things happen. Right? But I don't tempt the Lord that way. This verse isn't even speaking of that. It's speaking of the person that is arrested, and now they're being brought before magistrates, and, the Lord, and they're worried about what to say. And the Lord says, I will speak through you. Have you guys ever been in a situation that was unique to you, and you're like, huh, I don't really know what to say. And all of a sudden you're talking and, and you're like, I wish someone would record this. This is really good. <laughs> and it's not you. Man, sometimes during counseling, I think, I, man, I'm so wise during counseling. You know why I'm wise during counseling? It's because I got nothing to say. And the person in front of me needs to be ministered to. And the Lord will minister through me. And I'm like, whoa, dude, I, that was good. But it was the Lord. It wasn't me. And it is awesome to see that happen. And the Lord's able to do that. The commentator, William Barclay, who's good on history, bad on theology. I'm just warning you if you use them. Um, <laughs> he says, it was not the humi uh, humiliation which early Christians dreaded, not even the cruel pain and agony, but many of them feared that their own unskillfulness in the words and defense might injure rather than commend the truth. They were worried about pleasing God when they spoke in front of magistrates. That's what they were mostly worried about. And so he's saying, don't worry about it. It is the promise of God that when a man is on trial for his faith, the words will come to him. What a blessing, right? Be willing to step into places that are over your head spiritually if you know the Lord's leading you there because he will speak through you. And I, I love it. You guys know I study like crazy all the time. But I love being in that situation where God's going to speak through me. It's, it's awesome. It is such a blessing. And so this is the assurance that they get. Verse 21, Now brother will deliver up his brother to death, and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. So you're going to find opposition from the ones you're trying to reach. You're going to find opposition from religious people. You're going to find relig or, uh, opposition from governmental authorities and now your own family. Guys, have a good Sunday. We're done. No, just kidding. <laughs> but be warned. Opposition is going to be here until the Lord comes back. Ultimately, he's going to take care of it all. We read the end of the book and we know who wins. But the persecutions and martyrdoms of the church during the first 300 years of the church reveal that in, there, there were many stories of family members betraying believers to the authorities. But this happens today all over the world, throughout all area, eras of time, and again, even today. In many parts of the world, a family will disown them if they become a Christian. And, and some of you have faced that persecution. Maybe your life was a mess, and you were out there partying, smoking dope, and you know, getting, in fight at, <laughs> getting in fights at the quinceañeras or whatever, you know, because you're drunk. 
It's a South Texas thing I learned over the years. <laughs> but, you know, and, 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 you, and then all of a sudden you get saved and you clean up your life and then you show up and you start mowing your, your family's lawn to help them out and whatever. And they go, you were so much funner back then. And, and your life was an absolute mess and they persecute you and they start saying, you're a fanatic. I can't believe you actually give money to that church or you pay money to go serve people in Mexico. You're crazy. You know, and, 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 and so that's kind of a light persecution. But you, you guys have faced it, haven't you? In some countries, though, like Japan, if you become a Christian out of a Buddhist family, they'll have a Buddhist funeral for you, and they'll consider you dead from then on. Talking about going to your own funeral, right? In India, some of the Muslim countries, a person's own family will have a family member put to death in an honor killing, and you've probably heard of those. Now, let me say this. Most of your average Muslims that are trying to just live out their life love their wife, they love their kids, and they work super hard, and they will talk to you about Jesus. In, in their religion, his name is Isa, and, and love him. Relationship is so important within the Muslim community, but there are radicals that will have their family members put to death if they convert to Christianity, and it's called honor killing. You dishonored the family by leaving the faith. Hmm. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, the Lord warned. Why? I'm not so bad. I'm full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. But if you live out the fruits of the Spirit perfectly, it's just bizarre that you would be persecuted. But the Lord says you will be. But let me ask you, why did they kill Jesus? He told the truth and backed it up with action. Isn't that a good Christian's goal? And since they love the lie and they love where they are, they're going to oppose the truth. And they will oppose you. The world has fallen. Fallen from where? In the garden they had the truth of God and they had fellowship with God. And they fell from that. We're now reinstituted to the truth of God and fellowship with God. And they're falling away from that. And, and, and so this opposition where it's like, no, I don't want you to shine light on my ugliness or I don't want you to challenge me or I love my sin and, and you want me to become a Christian and let go of my sin. Whatever it might be, for whatever reason, you want me to let go of my traditions, you want to let me go of my job, possibly, or whatever it might be. But they will oppose you. So... I want to be like Jesus. Then should I attract a bit of persecution? On the night he was betrayed, Jesus told the disciples, he said, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Now, I want you to know, throughout the years, Christians have been persecuted for being stupid. <laughs> Don't claim that one. If you're persecuted, let it be for righteousness, for Christ's sake. If you're filled with the presence of Jesus and live like he did, and you're hated, it is for no good reason. The person has a problem, not you. If someone tells me, because I'm espousing a biblical truth, that I'm evil, I'm looking, I, I can look at them and go, okay, you can call me evil, but it's God that taught me this principle. So you're literally calling God evil. I don't have to be that self-defensive, do I? Because that person is opposing God directly. And you need to understand this. The quality of a man can sometimes be seen by the character of his persecutors. Who's persecuting you? And then it says, but those who endure to the end will be saved. Now, a lot of people say, you got to endure and then you'll be, you'll be saved. If you don't endure, you won't be saved. It's more of an identifier than a way to work yourself into heaven. Okay? Because if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you may have some glitches in your walk. How many of you guys have ever backslid? God never gave up on you, but you, you kind of gave up on him for a while. But you're back, aren't you? You're here. 
And, and, and that's the proof of God's faithfulness. Because he cannot deny himself, he will be faithful. And when he makes you his child, he's not going to abort you. You're his kid. And he loves you. If my, if my daughters decide not to communicate to me, am I ever going to stop loving them or pursuing them? Absolutely not. And I'm, I'm not near as good of a father as the Lord is. He's the hound of heaven. So it's an identifier. When you endure to the end, you will be saved, those of you who are going through persecution. And so it's, he's, not, he's not waiting for you to like legalistically fall. Because Hebrews 7, 25 says, therefore, he's also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So you will face persecution, but why does the Lord tell us this? Just to warn us. And, and here's the crazy thing. That, you know, one of the biggest blessings about Christianity is nothing goes to waste. If God doesn't exist, you're just kind of bouncing around like a pinball machine in this evil world, just going bink, 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 and just taking it as it, as it comes and being bruised along the way and trying not to bleed to death before your time. And it's all random and it doesn't matter. But every bruise you get in the Lord has an eternal lesson held with it because nothing is a waste of time in the Lord. He uses all things for the good, ultimately to shape your character. One of the greatest growth times in my life was when my son died. And I'm a much better person for it. Oh, you're so insensitive, Pastor. No, I cried a lot. I sure grew a lot, too. I became a way better pastor, way more sensitive. You come to me with a hurt, I'm going to just quote a verse at you, Perelvia, go away. I'm going to go ouch with you because God allowed me to go through that. And it actually still, he used it for purpose. If I give it back to him, my garbage, he's going to make gold out of it. It's an investment. Everything matters in the Lord. Without the Lord, you're just getting bruises for no reason. Poor you. And you're just trying to survive and hang on until you die, and then you don't know what happens. Man, how pitiful is that? But with the Lord, he has purpose in everything. So he warns us. But man, don't stop. Because it's so beautiful when someone gets saved because you've been faithful and you continue to persevere in your walk with God. You know, my wife and I, we do a lot of marriage ministry. And sometimes they don't make it. But you know what? When they do, it'll hold us over for a lot of other ones too. So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to run into, you know, a hundred people that don't get saved to see that one whose eternal destiny saves. And I'm like, yeah! Like, party in heaven, party on earth. Right? That's awesome. What a blessing we have that this life is not a waste of time. And the Lord says, be warned. You ever get what you're not expecting like that frog? And you want to quit? No. That's not what I want to do. I want to press on through because the Lord is faithful. And then verse 23 is our last verse for the day. And it says, when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So he's saying, listen, if you get persecuted and no one's listening, it's okay to move on. Have you ever met that person who goes, I want to die for the Lord on the mission field because I'm tough. And it's like, that's not your determination yourself to do anyways. But if you're persecuted and there is a way out, it's okay. You can dust, dust, you know, knock the dust off and go somewhere else. And so the Lord's not saying, just, just sit in there and just get beat up. I mean, if, if the Lord just tells you specifically, that's what you're supposed to do. But if there's that way out, you, you're not just out there seeking persecution. Because that's crazy. <laughs> but when it comes, it's okay. The Lord will be with you, and he'll endure through it with you, or cause you to endure through it. And then you have this last phrase. For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Huh. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I have no idea what that verse means. Many interpretations have been given, some more plausible than others, but none really has satisfied my desire to know. So this is an example of me taking a chicken bone and putting it aside. And I'm not going to choke on it because there's a lot of chicken left. Right? 
As a young man, I thought I had to know everything. As an, as an older man, I realized God is so big, I cannot possibly know everything. And the more I know, the more I know I don't know. But one thing I do know, when I get to heaven, if... So when I get to heaven, I don't think I'm going to be worried about this verse. But if a million years down the line, I remember I was teaching on this Sunday morning, and I had no idea what this verse is, and I had to humble myself before the congregation, and I'd ask the Lord what this means, he would give me the meaning, and I'd go, oh, of course. Because it's in the Word of God, it's true. But I'm not going to create a doctrine out of something I don't understand. A lot of people do. And I'm not going to argue with you about ser after service about it either. So there. <laughs> But some, someday, if I care to know, I will know. And the reason I say that is because, yeah, I'm studied. I've, I've gotten some degrees in theology, and I study all the time. I've been teaching the Bible for 35 years. And, and let, me, let me let you know this, especially you guys that are young. You are free to not know everything. And it is okay. When I was young, I would argue my theology against this guy, that guy. Now I just fellowship with people. We can discuss things and have differences and stuff like that, but I don't have to know everything. In fact, I can't. If I could know everything about God, he'd be a pretty small God. And so I rejoice that sometimes I'm just befuddled because it's the mystery that causes me just to be more in love with the Lord because he's so much bigger than I could ever imagine. So you're free not to know everything. You're free not to argue about everything. Know the truth that you can know and let it set you free. And we're going to close with this before we celebrate in communion. So the worship team is going to start coming up. But we've been talking about trials and persecution. And I want you guys to leave encouraged. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Why? Because he hates you, because God loves you, right? It says, Resist him steadfast in the face, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect that means complete, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And every trial that I've ever gone through, you know, in, unless it takes me home, he's brought me to a place of settling. I, I've been able to settle in it. I don't know if you guys know this, but I, I think I may have mentioned it. My, my younger sister, there's six of us in our family, my younger sister passed away two weeks ago. But God's hand was on it. My, my brother had a retirement party, and I, I stayed a longer time in California for that reason, and so we had a retirement party for my brother. Don't look online. My, my family can't sing, and they had a karaoke machine, just saying. Um, <laughs> but my sister from Canada, who's married to a retired pastor in Canada, she actually flew down to surprise me. So it's just a sweet blessing that God brought together randomly, and I was out there to do a conference, not to have this family reunion. But the five of us were able to be together. And it's just like God saying, here's, you know, my, my, my sister is hard for me to figure out because we were estranged. She was, a, she was mentally ill and she was a drug addict. You know, and, and it broke the rest of our hearts. And uh, she was, you know, estranged from all of us. But, but what did God do? God, and you know what? That brought closure. Not complete closure. Obviously, I'm trying to struggle with, I haven't talked to her in three or four years and all this other stuff and should I have done more to help and I'd try to help and then I'd get spit at or slapped or whatever. It was just crazy, our relationship. And so it's very unsettling. But as I was looking at this verse this morning and finishing up the study, I'm just going, in everything, Lord, as long as you don't take me home and then everything's settled forever, right? But as I hang on to you, you bring me to a place of settle. Thank you, Lord. Guys, we have such an awesome faith. We have such an awesome God. We have so many blessings. And I'm not inviting trials. I'm not inviting persecution. I'm not inviting opposition, but it will come. And I need to be okay with that. And before it happens, I need to be determined. Just hang on to the Lord. Be a sheep. 
Stay next to the shepherd. Keep God on your side. Follow the rules that I've given you. They're better rules than, than your flesh. And, and, and you will be blessed. And I'm going to bring you to that point. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. And so in this world, guys, don't be freaked out. Don't have bricks by your couch to throw at your TV. God laughs at their foolishness, and he's your shepherd. He's got this. So we're going to celebrate in communion, and the worship team's going to play. And what communion does, or the Lord's Supper, it's what Jesus gave the disciples not to be saved, not to become more holy or sanctified. He just says, this is a reminder that I'm giving you of what I'm doing for you. And he took the bread and he said, this is my body, it's broken for you. Which means Jesus was physically punished as God in the flesh. Not for anything he had done, but for your sins. He was willing to take the whip, he was willing to take the beatings, he was willing to take the, the, the crown of thorns, the spitting, the ripping out of his beard. He was willing to take that because he loved you so much. And so that's what the bread represents. And then he took the cup. And it represented his blood. But throughout the scriptures, blood means life. And it was poured out on your behalf. So the wages of sin is death. There was a wage that you, you have accrued towards your life. Or, uh, and he paid that wage. He paid that penalty by the pouring out of his blood. And so he says, do this in remembrance of me. And why does that help? Why do we do that? Listen, you can go out in your life and not think about Jesus, but you're going to live it differently than when you are thinking about Jesus. And Jesus knows this. This is why he wants us to remember and keep him central and keep him focused in our life. And so it's really a time of thankfulness. Lord, thank you. And then you take and you eat in obedience and remembrance of him. And so if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, whatever you know, your, your walk looks right now, but if you know that you know him, you're free to receive and remember and be thankful for what he did for you on the cross. And so as we worship, you're free to come up and you can sit down in your seat and pray with someone or you do it by yourself, however you want to do it. But we're going to celebrate in communion and do this truly honorably in remembrance of him. And then the worship team will go ahead and close the service when it seems ready. God bless you guys.